to sing because God is our audience, okay? We're singing for an audience of one this morning, and he doesn't care if you don't hit all the pitches right, okay? He cares about what's in your heart. So let's worship him. Let's, uh, this is an incredible song, Great I Am. Just uh, listen as we describe how awesome God is. And Yeah. 
It's time for you to have a little hoedown in you. Stand up. Here we go. Oh, son. to take just a moment and watch. This uh, kind of uh, tells us some Hayden First Baptist was first organized on August the 8th, 1915 as Hayden Missionary Baptist Church. The church had a humble beginning with only four members. They first met in the Rockland Schoolhouse, which was located about 100 yards northwest of the railroad bridge over Highway 160. Then in November of 1916, the church minutes state that they found themselves locked out of the school building. The Farmers Union offered them their hall and they continued to meet there until they completed a church building in May of 1919. That early church building was known as the Church on the Hill. Even though that building no longer stands, our understanding was that the rear of the building was rooted in the hillside, with the front of the building coming away from the hill supported by stacked rock columns. The underside of the church actually became a place where the children would play in the shade. The most dramatic event in the early life of the church was a revival held in August of 1935. The revival was a joint venture between the Baptist and the Methodist. It was led by our pastor, Reverend Judson Jones, and he was assisted by Reverend Edgar Jean. There were a total of 68 saved, and of those, 52 joined our church. Many of the families who are a part of our church today began their connection with First Baptist Hayden as a result of this revival. This photo is of six men who were leaders in the church on the hill in 1938. In the front row, you see John Hardwick, Franklin Milligan, and S.L. Bradley. And on the back row is Fred Boren, Carl Standridge, and Grady Reno. In 1944, a new church building was completed, and our church moved to what became known as Rock Church on Highway 160. Notice you can see the cornerstone on the left side, which is now framed in the hallway outside our present sanctuary. The church building ran parallel to the highway with the front entrance facing west. This original church building is still part of our present structure. You can see the rock on the outside of the front of our church. The sanctuary was located where our nursery is today. Throughout the 40s and 50s, the church continued to grow. Basement classrooms were added to the church in 1947. Our first recorded VBS was in 1953 and there were 60 students. VBS continues today as a vital part of our community outreach. Many children have been led to Christ through this ministry. In 1954, the church began training union, or what would now be known as discipleship training. 
In August of 1955, the church added air conditioning, and all God's people said amen. In 1956, the church began the process of building a pastorium on the land adjoining the church. The work was completed that year. That house stood in what is now our back parking lot. It was later sold and moved just a block away. In 1961, the church voted to build a two-story addition to the back of the church. This addition would contain more classrooms. This area is where our present offices are located today. It was at this time that some of the classroom space in the downstairs of the church was converted into a fellowship hall. Fellowship has always been part of the lifeblood of this church. Here are a few clips of past fellowships. Look close and you might recognize a few people. In January 1979, work began on a new auditorium for First Baptist. The new sanctuary was completed and dedicated on October 21, 1979. This sanctuary is the one that we are worshiping in today. In 1989, a two-story education wing was added. This building is still used for most of our adult and children's classes. The late 90s showed continued growth in our church. The church purchased the house next door in 1996 and created the youth complex. And then in 1998, there was a renovation on our church auditorium. It was enlarged and remodeled with the addition of the stained glass windows as well as the addition of the front atrium and porch outside the church offices. Then in 2001, the church purchased the Reed House for future growth. That building is now being used as a part of our Operation 56 ministry to the fifth and sixth graders. Our church has always been about the business of knowing Jesus and making Him known. For those of us who are members, it is a privilege to be a part of an incredible history. Lives have been changed as a result of our presence in this community. To date, there have been 970 baptisms since the beginning of our great church. First Baptist Hayden is a place where lifelong commitments are formed. It's a place where families can grow. place for fun and fellowship. It's about serving God and others. Loving other people. It's about a message worth sharing. It's about a future. Let's give God all the glory.
on either. <laughs> oh, there we go. Gosh, it's good to see you today. If you have your copy of the Word of God, would you turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew? Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter, and the 25th through the 27th verse. I'm sure that for many of you that 2015 has been a very depressing year for Christianity. Islamic terrorists in the Middle East like ISIS and Boko Haram are beheading Christians on an unprecedented scale. Marriage uh, has been redefined by the Supreme Court of the United States of uh, America. The present White House administration seems that it has an ax to grind and is on a witch hunt uh, against uh, Christianity. Churches are experiencing unprecedented litigation, lawsuits. Seems like a, a nut can get loose in a, a Bible study group in Charleston, South Carolina, and nine people uh, lose their life. And yet still people filter into the church looking for answers to so many problems that confront them every day. Well, church, you can take courage. You can look around because I have some good news for you. There is a phrase that is mentioned eight times in the Bible, and every time that phrase was used, it was used by the Lord Jesus, and he used it as a command or as an imperative. Uh, one of those places that, uh, that I have chosen chosen is, is one of those eight. Uh, in preparation for the sermon, I got all eight of those. A and then I narrowed it down to three real good ones. And then I saw in the bulletin I had 15 minutes, and so I've narrowed it down to, to just basically one that, that I want to hit the, the high spot on. The Bible says in uh, chapter 14, verse number 25, Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And he cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. That phrase, be of good cheer, is given to us by the Lord Jesus in eight different instances. My question is, why did he do that? He did that because of the surrounding problems that had confronted those people that were next to him. One of the places that he used that was in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, where they brought a paralytic to the Lord Jesus Christ, that one that was carried by those four people that were let down in the building while Jesus was teaching. And Jesus looked at that individual and said, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. The problem that confronts so many people today is the problem of sin. They don't really know what to do with it. They're having troubles as... Uh, it has invaded their lives. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins can be forgiven. When Jesus spoke about sins being forgiven, he used the unique Greek word that means to carry or weigh or to bear away. Jesus took your sins out of the way, having nailed them to the cross. Your problem doesn't have to be your sins because in the Lord Jesus, your sins can be forgiven you. You understand that Jesus not only forgives sins, but the Bible says that Jesus forgets sin. I know that it is hard for us as human beings to forget those things that have been done toward us and done against us, that sometimes we carry those, not as grudges, but we carry those as scars that we have as we journey down the road of life. You understand that every once in a while they will creep back into our lives, but it's not that way with God. God has not only a great memory, but God has a divine forgetter. When God forgives a, a sin, 
He not only forgives those sins, but he forgets those sins. The Bible says that he has separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says that he has cast our sins behind his back, and your back is behind you no matter how fast you turn around. And you understand that he said that he has cast them into the sea of forgetfulness, and he will never, never remember those anymore. When we sometimes come to the Lord and say, God, do you remember what kind of fellow that I was before I got saved? And God doesn't remember who we are. He doesn't look at us as some broken down wretch of a sinner that, that walked through the muck and the mire of this world, but he sees you now as God's son, as a part of a chosen family. He sees you as a royal priesthood. He understands that you are a son in the family of God. But there was another place that he used this when he said that these things I have spoken to you that... It, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We see Jesus once again using that phrase, telling us that in this world we are going to have tribulation, but he has come in order that he might bring peace to our hearts. Sometimes when we look at peace, we find that it is difficult to define. There was a group of artists that was asked if they could paint a picture that would typify what peace really was. There was one artist who was so skilled, he took his paints and his brushes and he painted a pastoral scene. He had a lovely uh, field with flowers. He had beautiful trees. He had a little babbling brook that was running through that little fog that was coming up in the meadow, and he defined that as being peace. There was another artist that took a picture much like of the Madonna. There was a mother sitting there. She was holding a little sleepless baby, uh, sleeping baby, and, and you know how peaceful that can be if you've ever had children. And, and she was sitting there rocking and, and uh, having a, uh, just a moment of reflection. And, and that was his scene of peace. But the real scene of peace was painted by an artist who took a picture of a, a, a raging stream that, that came flowing muddy and, and filled with sticks and, and, and debris overrunning its banks. There was rain that was falling. There was wind that was blowing through the trees. And there, over that raging stream, there was perched a, a bird nest. And that bird nest contained a, a mother bird and, and her little bitty babies, and each one was singing through the midst of that storm. That's what peace really is. It is not the absence of storms. It is the fact that you can sing in the midst of the storms. And the reason that you can do that is because of the text that I have chosen today, and it has to do with the storms of life that those disciples were facing. The Bible says that it was the fourth watch of the night from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. They had been rowing, rowing all night long. They have virtually gotten nowhere. And Jesus came walking to them and Jesus made a sidewalk on the sea. And he came to those disciples, and those disciples were fearful, thinking that Jesus was an apparition, that he was a ghost. When Jesus spoke to them and told them that they could be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. One of those times Jesus spoke of his pardon, another time that he spoke of his power, but in this particular case, he spoke of his presence. That Jesus was there, and he was there in the midst of the storm. I am guilty sometimes of being one of those preachers that will make an erroneous statement, even though it is good, and sometimes it is true. And in many times, we find that it's not so true. And that is, if you'll trust Jesus, everything will be all right. And sometimes, 
Folks, understand it in the context in which we're given. But you understand that many times that Christians don't have it all right. Many times there are real storms that people face. Some scholars said that people in life are either just coming out of a storm or they're in the midst of a storm or there is a storm on their horizon. We understand that the Bible says that man that is born of woman is but few days and they are full of trouble. And we understand that life has taught us that just because we know Jesus Christ that we didn't get some kind of immunity from the d disease and the decay that is in this world. We understand that Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble, that you're going to have tribulation. And because you have gotten saved doesn't mean that the dog isn't going to die and doesn't mean that you're not going to lose your job, doesn't mean that your car isn't going to get hit by lightning, doesn't mean any of those things that God does not put up some guard all shield that just seems to protect us that from everything that comes our way. We understand that our days are short and that they are full of trouble, but God is always with us during the storms of life, that you can count on him during those storms, but not only during a storm, but in every situation of life, whatever you're going through, the Bible says, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content, content with such things that you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can always count on Jesus. Your friends might let you down. Your family might let you down. Your society might let you down. Your government might let you down. Political figures may let you down. Economists may let you down. But Jesus is never going to let you down. Jesus is going never to leave you, but he is always going to forsake you. There is some good news in a world filled with bad news that you can take courage, that you can be of good cheer, because Jesus says, it is I, be not afraid. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your power, your presence, and your pardon in our life. Father, bless this time. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a break uh, in just a moment. <clears throat> but first, I was asked to share just briefly with you uh, a word of tribute. We wanted to take time to remember Brenda Armstrong. She was a longtime church member and who is now uh, rejoicing with us in heaven. As chairman of the Centennial Celebration Committee, she began planning all of this. She, uh, she was uh, kind of in charge of everything that's taking place this weekend. But as you go into the main hallway, if you go out the back door and into the main hallway, you're going to see a shadow box with all of our pastor's names beginning in 1915. Brenda wanted us to have this as a reminder of the men that God called to serve him in this church through the last 100 years. She loved our church, and we love her. Uh, just remember... Just throw up a little thought towards Brenda today as we celebrate. We're going to give you a break now. Uh, we're going to uh, be dismissed. If you walk out the back, there, the adult hallway is kind of down here in that direction. There are some rooms set up uh, with memorabilia pictures. There are snacks downstairs. We ask that you please partake of that. And also, just while we're stopped, after the second segment that starts at 1030, we're going to start at 1030, uh, there is going to be lunch following all of this. And I was told to tell you there is plenty of food. If you are visiting with us, please plan to stay for lunch, okay? <clears throat> you can be dismissed, and I'll see you back at 1030. <clears throat>